As I was preparing this morning's message, you know, I always like to introduce with a, a little story, an illustration, and to bring the point across, I wasn't sure what story I should share with you. Because the story I wanted to share with you illustrates the knee-jerk reaction that happens when we or somebody else falls into sin. What's the first thing we do when there's misconduct or there's bad behavior? What's the first thing that we do? We try and cover it up, right? And so there's, there's a story of a presidential candidate who stepped forward in 2006 that he was running for the presidency. His name's John Edwards. A good-looking, well-versed attorney. He was the senator of North Carolina. And so he began his campaign running for the, the presidency of the United States and gaining quite good ground. But unfortunately, along the campaign trail, the tabloids and the news media started surfacing inconsistencies in his campaign. For example, he hired um, a media firm that was owned by a young lady, and um, she was going to shoot footage for his, on his campaign trail. And the tabloids picked up on this and they started publicizing that there was inappropriate relationship between um, this presidential candidate, um, John Edwards, and this young lady. And the media went crazy and obviously what happened was his whole campaign trail ground to a halt. But it got to the ears of the federal government and to the IRS, and they started doing an inquiry, and eventually a grand jury actually indicted John Edwards. But he and this media businesswoman adamantly denied that there was no inappropriate behavior that was taking place. And so um, the grand jury was ready to indict um, John Edwards, and he vehemently on the campaign trail denied everything, and apparently was pushing everything undercover. When, after he had pulled back off the campaign trail and decided not to continue running, the whole story came out, incredible media outlets, that indeed there were inappropriate uh, behaviors that took place with um, John Edwards and the director of this media firm. So, here's the point. Number two in your notes, the first reaction when there is sin is to hide and to cover up. So, number two A, what goes part and parcel with sin? Secrecy, hiding, And cover-ups. And, I mean, we could, you could go on to Google and you could just type in political scandals. You could type in there religious leaders' scandals. You could type in any kind of leader scandal and you're going to find all kinds of things come up and people trying to cover up the indiscretions that took place in their lives. So it seems like that's the, f the first knee-jerk jer reaction. And so also, um, when the mother and the father of our race fell into sin, they did exactly that. And so if we look in the account, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 to 13, in your notes, we read verse 8 of Genesis 3, it says, And they heard the sound... Of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife did what? 
They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. So the event was, after they fell into sin, what was the first reaction? They hide. Then the Lord called to Adam in verse 9 and said to him, Where are you? So Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So what is the second thing that happens? Fear and shame. In verse 11, and he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman you gave, you, you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree. And the Lord God said to the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So what's the third thing that happens? We blame. <laughs> so there's quite a conundrum here. None of us want to admit that there are sins in our lives. None of us want to admit that we make major mistakes. None of us want to come into the open. And it seems to be part and parcel with sin, right? It seems to be part and parcel with sin. So um, in number 2B, in the last session, step 4, we learned the importance of looking into our personal mirror and to make a moral inventory of our lives, and here's your word, remember, in red, and made a moral inventory of our lives and being honest about our weaknesses, our wrongs, and our wounds. Remember? So we want to be honest. We don't want to hide. And the scriptures that we read there was 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Remember last week we spoke about if we, if we look in the mirror and we see the imperfections, what do we do? Do we go and try and change that? No, it points us to Christ. The law is the schoolmaster that points us to Christ. And so... When we see the blemishes and the weaknesses and, and all the bad things in the mirror, we don't try and remedy it ourselves. It points us to Christ. And this is what the scripture says. Do you not realize that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Matthew 7, verse 3 to 5. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look? A plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will cl see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, my friends, that knee-jerk reaction, when we, f when we fall into sin and we realize that we are wrong and we've made mistakes, it's so much easier to look at someone else's faults and to be in denial about our own faults. But the Bible clearly says, examine yourselves, look to see the plank in your eye. Don't worry about the speck in your brother's eye. Consider yourselves and see whether you are in the faith. So why do we need to face up to what our sins and our wrongdoings are? We see, we see our sins and our wrong, wrongdoings as the root cause. But our sins and our wrongdoings are not the root cause. There's something else deeper behind that. The reason we need to face up to our sins and our wrongdoings is because they are symptoms of a deeper underlying cause. If we ignore the symptoms and pretend they don't exist or focus on the symptoms of others, our disease will get worse and worse. Now, if I think of my sins and my wrongdoings as symptoms, 
I f- I'm quite relieved. Because symptoms are not what we should be dealing with. Symptoms are a sign that there's something wrong, right? But my friends, the enemy is the accuser, and he comes to us and he says, look what you're doing. And he envelops you in this, in this sin and this wrongdoing. He shames you like Adam and Eve, and he forces you to, to want to run and hide and hide these symptoms. But the Bible says, no, examine yourselves. Look in the mirror. When you see the wrongdoing, turn to Christ. Christ is going to cleanse you. Christ is the healer. He's the doctor. He's going to deal with the symptoms, but he's going to go to the root cause in order to deal with the symptoms. And it's amazing how we as sophisticated, well-educated, new millennium wise people always tend to deal with the symptoms. So when I get influenza and my nose is running and I've got a headache, what do I do? I take medication so that it will stop my nose running, so it it, it blocks it up somehow in my sinuses and no longer runs. My headache is relieved, but do I still have the influenza virus in my body? So I don't deal with that. That's the root cause. So the body naturally raises up the temperature in order to kill that virus. What do I do? I take medication to, raise, to drop my temperature. The body's natural mechanism is when when your temperature raises up, the virus can't survive at that temperature, and it kills the virus. But we suppress those symptoms. And it's the same in our sinful lives. Sin is a symptom of the underlying cause, and we continually hide those symptoms and suppress those symptoms. So here's, um, here's what we should be doing. We need to admit to the symptoms, realize that there's a root cause, and then submit to the healer. So number, number 2D, imagine how many people would die if they hid the symptoms of their life-threatening diseases like cancer, for example. The symptoms that come up from a life-threatening disease are or warning lights to say there's something wrong, deal with the cause. There's something wrong, deal with the cause. There's something wrong, deal with the cause. And it's the same with sin. But we tend to want to hide and pretend that it's not there. We want to suppress the symptoms by human effort. And that's just a disaster. It's just a disaster. So hiding isolates and entrenches the sin or the symptoms. Just as toxins build up inside of the body, when provision hasn't been made for them to be expelled, so sin builds up in the soul and poisons the whole being of the person who hasn't had a way for it to be exposed and expelled. How many of us are dealing with things over 20, 30, 40, 50 years of our lives. And we ignore them and we suppress them. And we as Christians want to present this this perfect facade to each other and to the world. And so there's a story of a pastor who had a pretty troublesome lady in his congregation. She was always snapping at people and being unruly and and rude. And the pastor decided there must be something behind this. And so he went and visited with this lady. And after much discussion back and forward and back and forward, he found out that this lady's husband had left her for another woman 30 years ago. And she was still 
angry and bitter. And it was coming out in all kinds of behaviors in the local church. Now, this is not one of my church members. This was taken off the Google images. <laughs> but the point that each one of us need to consider is, are there the, is there the symptom of sin below the surface in each one of our lives that we are covering up and not facing up to? Now, I have my nice suit on this morning. Um, it's the suit I got married in. It's quite, quite nice. Don't you think it's nice? What does the Bible say? How many have sinned? All have sinned. Have I sinned? Have you sinned? Were we born in sin? Do we have sinful natures that naturally gravitate towards sin? What does the Bible say? The Bible says that we, that the sinful nature is at enmity against God. It cannot do the, it cannot keep the law. All right, so let's have this garbage bag represent sin. Now, I can do one of two things. The Bible says I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. I have a sinful nature. I've got a natural propensity towards sin. I can do one of two things. I can either say yes. I am a sinner. I have a, a, a different propensity or a different bent towards the sin than you do. So in other words, if we compare it to the disease, I have a different disease to you, but we're all diseased. So I, I, I can do one of two things. I can either admit that I have it, and I can not share it with all of you, but I can be honest about it, especially in the way that I deal with you, or what I could do is I could try and hide it from you. So let's see how much I can hide it. Now, if I could slip it under my shirt, I probably would do that, but um, I'm the pastor of the church, right? So, I don't want you to know that there are things in my life. Is that good? Now I feel worthy. I feel like I can stand up in front of you and I can at least do what God has called me to do. And yes, when I pray the prayer and I say, Lord... I confess my sin to you. What does he say? He's faithful and just to forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But my friends, it's only when we are honest and we, we, we deal with those symptoms and we say, Lord, I'm accepting what your word says to me. I am a sinner. And we confront those symptoms. Instead of like taking the, flu medi the sin flu medication and trying to suppress those symptoms and, and pretend they're not there so that people, when people look at us, they, they won't see anything wrong. But yet behind closed doors and in our minds. And that's why Jesus kept saying, you say don't commit adultery in Moses' law, but I say what you think what you think. So there is no hiding from God, but there's hiding from one another and there's hiding from ourselves. There's hiding from ourselves. The bitter root, my friends, is only expelled once we become transparent and open. You see, Levels of transparency promotes healing. There's a saying that says we are as sick as our secrets. 
Now, now secrets, as we saw with Adam and Eve, secrets promote shame, fear, alienation, isolation, denial, pretending that it doesn't exist. In, we feel inadequate, we've got this anger, we've got this blaming, we've got this, this, seething, this seething cesspool that we're constantly trying to patch up. It's like sewage that's, that's leaking out. Self-hatred, guilt, isolation, dishonesty, low self-worth, depression, defensiveness. Whereas when we are transparent and we just admit, hey, we're in this hospital We're all diseased. The great physician is treating us. The great physician is cleansing us. We have trust, purity, tolerance, serenity, openness, forgiveness. We accept others because we know we're all in the hospital together. We we have confidence. We have a sense of belonging. We are patience. We have gratitude, peace, self-acceptance. And we are willing to be accountable to one another. It's a much better environment than to be in hiding. See, the word occult, the word occult actually means secretive or hidden from view. The spiritists are always in the dark places meeting together secretly. They dress like you, they speak like you, but they actually have got another whole agenda going on behind closed doors. Hence, the Bible speaks of the doers of evil as walking in darkness. God calls His children to walk in the light, where everyone can see them, not hiding in the darkness. If we have nothing to hide, then we won't worry about seeing into our lives. Right? So cherishing or holding on or hiding sin keeps sin embedded and burdened deep within our souls. Like mold, sin grows in dark places. Like mold, sin dies when exposed to the light. So my friends, number four, everything needs to be brought out into the light. Step five says, we admitted the exact exact nature of our sins to ourselves, confessed them to God, and exposed our struggles to a trustworthy person. And exposed our troubles to a trustworthy person. So, the Bible says to us, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Do we confess our sins to to man? No, we don't. We confess our sins to God. Do we admit our sins to ourselves? Yes, we do. But there's an additional component that helps us to to cast light into our lives. And that is to, to prayerfully consider finding a spiritual father or a spiritual mother, a spiritual brother or a spiritual sister to whom we can share some of these dark corners in our lives. We never want to be as specific with this person as we are with God, but we do want to share that we struggle with a certain area or a certain principle in our lives, that that person can help lessen the power of that that burden or that stronghold. I'll show you now what the Bible says about that. Um, Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Ephesians 5, 11 to 13. It says, But have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. And then 1 John 1 verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in the darkness, 
we lie and do not practice the truth. We lie and do not practice the truth. So we need to place ourselves in an environment where we can't hide and where they can't be in the darkness. Now, our society, unfortunately, is set up for privacy. You know, you've got the, you've got the remote for the garage door. You're driving in, you click the remote, and zoop, you go into the garage, and zoop, you close the door, and you go into your house. It's not like the good old days when we used to just drop by someone's home and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, no, we've got to call and make an appointment. Um, a lot of us don't have our families with us. We're alone. Um, it can easily become a dark place for us to be. The Bible calls believers to exhort one another, bear one another's burdens, and speak the truth in love to one another. How can that be done when a believer's deeds are hidden and undisclosed to a trustworthy person? You got that question? How can I exhort you? How can I encourage you? How can I speak the truth in love to you when I know absolutely nothing about your life? Each one of us needs somebody that's trustworthy, confidential, who can exhort us, who can carry our burden with us, and who can speak the truth in love to us. See, I need somebody that I can say, listen, I have this thing. I need help. Because when I hide it, it possesses me. It's between me and this thing, yes, and between me and God. But I need to be accountable. I need somebody to be able to call me up and say, what's happening? How's it going? Exhort, carry, and speak the truth. In love, and here the scriptures are. Hebrews uh, 3, verse 12 and 13, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you, in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, as it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What is this deceitfulness? Hiding. Deceit means you don't know what it is. It's something that's hidden from view. That's what the occult is. So when I exhort you daily, there's no deceitfulness. There's no hiding. If I'm a person that you trust, you come to me and you say, this is what's keeping me up at night. I've prayed about it. I've given it to the Lord I'm struggling with this. Can you pray with me? Can you, what, how do you see it from the outside? Then bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the greatest burden that we have? It's sin. So if I'm bearing your burden, I'm, I'm walking alongside you and I'm, prayerfully giving you another believer's perspective. We're bringing things into the light. We're not hiding. Because you see, my friends, we all have this. So whether you talk about uh, an addiction to pain medication, or whether I talk about um, not being able to get off sugar, or if I talk about um, impure thoughts, or you're talking about um, perhaps a problem with honesty or stealing, is the black any different with one to another? No, it's not. It's not. But churches, we love to hide. We love to pretend. We love to be, have, have it all together. 
But until the Lord comes one day, my friends, that's a whole different sermon. <laughs> I believe that we will have victory over sin before Jesus comes. I believe it. But we can't have victory over sin unless we own up to our sin and stop hiding. To where we can be so dependent on Christ indwelling and Christ infilling that He lives His perfect life through us. And until that time, until that time, we need to stop pretend. We need to be stop, stop hiding. We need to stop hiding in the darkness. And how beautiful it will be if we can just treat one another in that manner. I have a cold. You've got a, a broken leg. You have a headache. You, you have um, an infection. We're all looking for healing. We all need to be feasting on the bread of life and the water of life in order to find healing for our soul. So these passages demonstrate how God works through the body of Christ to bring healing to the members. When there is an infection in one of the limbs, the whole body sends resources to that limb in order to facilitate its healing. It's so beautiful. So when you have an, when, when when you've cut your when you've cut your arm, and and there's a uh, there's a scab forming there, the body sends all its little fighter cells. It sends it sends resources. It sends repairing materials. It sends antibodies to stop the infection. It sends to that particular part in order to give it healing. And we are the body of Christ. When one of us are wounded. We can send our resources to that person to help them. Healing takes place in community. The Bible tells us it was not good for man to be alone, and it's not just because he didn't have a woman. Man was created for fellowship. Man was created for support, for interaction. And so when, when one part of the body is sick, the rest of the body come together to bring healing to that part of the body. But we are so afraid, we are so shameful, we are so um, intimidated by the quote-unquote holiness of others that we go and we hide and we never find the healing that we need. Step five says no. Look in the mirror, realize that you're a sinner, you've made a moral inventory of your life, you've looked at the cause and the effect of where you are today and what your life is. And now you come, you admit this to yourself, you confess this to God, you confess the gory details to God, and then as you walk along life's way, you prayerfully ask for a, a trustworthy, dependable man or woman of God, men with men, women with women, to support you to pray with you, and to help turn on the light so that you're not in the darkness alone. So that you're not in the darkness alone. So my friends, what we need is tenderness, realizing that we're all sinners. We need trust, and we need transparency. And so the person who, who God prayerfully leads you to, also being a sinner, now has the opportunity to develop this trust. The trust that is worthy to receive your word about where your life is and the struggles that you're going, the burdens that you are bearing. How many of us are trustworthy? How many of us can be that person that a, a wounded sinner comes to confide in and, and, and to look for help and support. How many of us can truly be that person? That is a great challenge to be able to 
zip our lip, to open and just keep our ears tuned in to what the cries of a fellow brother and a fellow sister is. Like Adam and Eve, we are afraid of being exposed. We are ashamed and we want to stay in hiding. But in order to be healed, we need to give and receive tenderness, trust, and transparency. When we do, a healing culture will develop in our church. A healing culture will develop in our church. Why isn't there the same culture in our churches that are in the hospitals today? Why isn't there the same HIPAA patient confidentiality laws in the churches where members feel safe to expose their struggles in order to be liberated from the strongholds of sin? As a pastor, I often have to call into the hospital to find out about a patient. Boy, and do I have to struggle to just find out what the condition of the patient is. Unless the patient has given me a four-digit PIN code, I cannot find out what's going on with that patient as an outsider. Because the HIPAA laws, I'm not sure what the HIPAA stands for, but it's a confidentiality pact, contract, creed that the hospital has made for the protection of the patient's privacy. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you and I knew we could walk into church, if we've had the worst week of our, of our lives, we've fallen flat on our faces, and we're feeling bruised and broken. Yet when we come into church, we can share with that brother or that sister, or even in a small group in the 12-step class, and you know that those people have got your back. That we accept one another as being fellow pilgrims, fellow sinners along the way. How wonderful that would be. Do you have somebody like that in your life? It could be a husband, it could be a spouse. But very often, we can't even share our deep, deep secrets in a marriage, sometimes we need someone outside that can just hear us and pray with us and help heal things that happened in our lives many, many years ago. So how many of you this morning would like to commit to tenderness, to trust, and transparency? It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? I think we should ask the Lord right now to help us to begin to gain a vision of what a culture would look like with tenderness toward one another, trust, and transparency. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you did put the church in place, intended to have spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, spiritual sisters, and spiritual brothers that are tender, trustworthy, and transparent. And Father, this morning we commit to walking in the light, the healing light that destroys the mold and the bacteria, and the virus of sin. We thank you for the power of the Son of God, that when we come into His presence, the healing balm is um, spread into our lives, and we can have victory, complete victory over sin. Teach us to be honest, Lord. Teach us to be transparent. And as we journey step by step, give us an understanding of what 
complete victory over sin will look like through the indwelling of your spirit in each of our lives is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I thank you for journeying with us through these steps. Um, I invite you to pick up the rest of the, the handouts if you've not really re got them yet. Um, for those who would like to pray after the service, the men meet at the back, the women meet here in the front. Let's keep a, a prayerful, meditative atmosphere in the congregation as we dismiss so that um, those who want to just keep um, meditating and praying can do that. Uh, the deaconesses will uh, dismiss us now from the front.